Our counting is starting. Okay, um, do you have everybody's attention? All right, um, today's lecture, we're gonna have uh, uh, Professor Stokes in from University of Houston. And um, she also, I think you got your PhD from Uni mm -hmm. University of Houston as well. And so um, she's gonna be talking about uh, optical analysis of a couple different types of super lattice. And she's, um, I, I think it's your first time at UH Clear Lake? Not first time here, but just first time finding my way around. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, this should be very interesting. And also, um, she, you know, as a professor at University of Houston, she's also somebody who you can work with through our collaborative PhD program. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Stokes. Also, I'll be uh, handing out the uh, sign-in sheet, too. Thanks, David. Uh, as David said, I'm a professor at University of Houston in the Department of Physics. And in this class, I'm just going to give you some of the results that um, my students brought to the jury to look at got on uh, our research on the structural and optical characterization of Indian arsenide and gallium and tuminide super lattices. Um, this work was done at U of H in collaboration with my collaborators there, as well as with my collaborators at the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, D.C. And the work was supported by NSF, ONR, and DARPA. So before I get started with our results, let me just give you some background into uh, what the Indian Arsenide Dynamic and Arsenide Lattice is all about. So superconductor heterostructures, there's two types. There's the type 1 heterostructure and the type 2. In the type 1 heterostructure, you have two semiconductor materials, two different materials. These two materials have different band gaps. When you draw one layer on top of the other, in layer B being sandwiched between two layers of, of A, you end up creating quantum wells and barriers. In the type 1 structure, the conductor band of material B falls below the conductor band of material A, and valence band of B above the, below, above the valence band of A. So you create these quantum wells and barriers, and you end up with energy uh, bands created in the hole in electron well. Now for the type P2, which is conductor, <laughs> semiconductor, we have a material such as indium arsenide and gallium tuminide, the, the type of structure that I'll be talking to you about tonight. In this case, the conduction band that I have built material B actually falls below the valence band of the material A. We still create these quantum wells for the holes and electrons, but now we have this unique type two band structure lineup. And this is going to be interesting for device uh, applications. So, quantum wells and barriers are formed by using optical or electrical expectation. You can have electrons in a transition between these holes and electron wells. And this is going to be the foundation for many optical electronic devices. In particular, the devices that we are studying the system for are the initial uh, detectors. So, to create a super lattice of this type of material, we just grow multiple layers of the AB material. So you have a period which consists of an AB material, and you can grow this in numerous periods, up to hundreds of periods. And this will create a super lattice of that material. So why the type two band alignment? Well, it has some unique properties that are interesting for device applications, such as the overlap of the whole and electron wave function as we see here. Due to this overlap, we can design this structure so that we get an optical band that ranges from 3 to 30 microns, which is perfectly limited for the detector application. In addition, we get reduced OJ recombination and tunneling rate in this system compared to its type 1 counterpart, such as gallium arsenide, indium arsenide, type super lattices, which also make it very interesting for the detector application. Now, this system has been predicted to be able to operate with 3 to 30 microns and has been shown to have operation at many of those wavelengths. However, the maximum potential has not been achieved for the system due to material issues that uh, arise from growth. Material issues such as anion and mixing, as you can see, we have any arsenide gallium and terminal. Therefore, we have arsenic and antimony, two different anions, and we end up with intermixing a segregation of these two. Uh, elements across the interface is causing problems with the material. In addition, we have interface roughness, and we also see some structural instability. In particular, we see lateral composition modulation, which is just the spontaneous formation of periodic structures 
that form during the growth. And they actually form as the sample is growing layer by layer. These structures are actually formed, self-organized, no additional work needed to get them to uh, be created. And because of this lateral composition modulation, this is one thing that could be either hindering or may be used as an advantage for the system for uh, mid infrared detector applications. So what is lateral composition modulation? So if you look at this diagram here, we have a substrate, and then we grow this super lattice on top of the substrate. So you have A, B layer, so you know you're going to have a compositional variation in the vertical direction as you grow the samples layer by layer. But what happens with lateral composition modulation is you also get a variation in the composition in the lateral direction. Therefore, shown by these blue and white regions, this is actually a variation in the composition that you will see, and this is what happens spontaneously during growth. So not only do you get the variation in the vertical direction, you get it across the sample as well. Now, this has been a very good number of systems, as shown here, but has been stronger from short period supernatural. So a short period supernatural is one where the period, which is the thickness of the A and B layer together, is on the order of 10 angstroms. This occurs usually only along one in plane direction, and the modulation wavelength, is, which is the wavelength of the variation between the two different uh, compositions, is usually along <coughs> 500 to 500 angstroms. So, how does this composition modulation affect the actual uh, response or the material properties? It can be detrimental in some cases where it reduces the band gap, which may take it uh, below something that you want to use for your application, or that could be something that can enhance it. Not quite sure yet. Also, it can cause optical polarization and autotrophy, and it can also create nanostructures in your sample. So not only do you get this compositional variation, but you can also end up with things such as quantum wires from in your uh, super lattice sample. Now, typically this is avoided when these samples are grown for device applications. However, it's been shown that in lasers and LEDs, that uh, presence of LCM and quantum wires in the active region of the device has actually led to improved properties for those. Things such as uh, threshold current has been lowered, and things such as temperature stability has been improved. So, is it possible that we can use this lateral composition modulation in the indium arsenide gallium and tinnite superlattices for something that will improve upon the device performance that we have currently, or is it something that can be used to create new devices based on this system? The experimental techniques used for this project, the samples were grown by molecular beam epitaxy, and then they were structurally characterized by cross-sectional SPM, X-ray diffraction, and infrared absorption and photoluminescence. So by studying the response of the device optically, we can see if this LCM has affected the properties in a good way or a bad way. Also, we want to determine why this lateral composition modulation actually occurs. So we want to study the structure of it and try to determine what happened as the sample grew to result in this lateral composition modulation. So MBE. The samples are grown by MBE. They're grown for about 100 to 140 periods. Remember that's the MBE thickness of uh, the samples. The indium arsenide layer, the 13 model layer, which is about 39, 40 angstrom, and the gallium and seminar the same thickness, about 40 angstrom. They're grown on two different growth templates, where the growth template is the substrate buffer combination. Uh, we, we did three here. That's what I'm going to present. Uh, gallium and seminide buffer and substrate, gallium and seminide substrate, aluminum and seminide buffer, and indium and seminide buffer and substrate. Now, what these do are the, uh, it sets the strain they, for the super lattice, which is to be grown on top of it, because it's going to want to conform to whatever it's put on top of it. And the strain state is going to be important for determining why the lateral composition modulation and nanowires actually are formed on the structure. So this is just a little schematic of what this uh, sample looks like. You start with your substrate, you grow a buffer layer, and then you grow however many periods it is of the super lattice you like, and then you cap it off with a tap layer. 
In addition, we also want to pay close attention to the interfacial bonds that result in these methods. When you're going to uh, two layers that have different annulums, then you can have a variation of uh, various combinations that you can have layers form at the interface. So you have indium arsenide and gallium and tenonide. The interface layers can be indium and tenonide, they can be gallium arsenide, or they can be a combination of those, even a ternary or quaternary alloy that exists at the interface. So for this system, it's going to be important because the interfacial bond is actually going to have a huge effect on the strain relationship between the layers and the super lattice. So for our study, we use a technique called migration enhanced epitaxy, which is a growth technique that's based mainly on taking advantage of the migration of the electrons or migration of the atoms as they deposit on the surface. And it's a shutter technique that makes sure that you get the interface that you want. So we use this technique to ensure that we get 95% uh, of the interfaces to either be indium and terminide or gallium arsenide, as we can see here. So by opening and closing the shutters just right, we can make sure that we get the bond that we want at the interface. And these samples are grown at Naval Research Lab. So what's so important about the interface and the structure of this sample? Where it's all going to come down to the strain of the system and layers to these samples. Because the strain is going to be uh, the, the big predictor of whether the sample will be stable or unstable during growth. Stable meaning you'll get a sample that's planar, meaning that you have exactly what you try to go. Medium arsenide, gallium arsenide, and a flat array. Unstable means that you get the indium arsenide and the gallium and tenonide, but you could have undulations within the layer, meaning that the layer is ripple, and you can also have variations in the thickness of the layer as it goes across in the lateral direction. So by stability theory, the samples which are grown, and this is for a sample grown on a gallium and tenonide, gallium and tenonide template. For those samples, the gallium and seminar layer would be unchanged because it would have the same lattice constant as the substrate and buffer. The indium arsenide layer would be under tensile strain because they have a lattice constant which is less than that of gallium and seminar. And it would have a, a misfit of 0.62 where misfit is defined based on the lattice constant of the layer and the lattice constant of the substrate. Now, the indium and seminide interface would be under compressive strain, which is a negative 6.28 in this bit. Therefore, we would have a layer that's under tensile strain, and then we would have our interface layer, which is under compressive strain. This combination of the tensile and compressive strain leads to what's called um, strain balance. So this should lead to a sample that is stable. For the gallium arsenide, uh, interfaces. Again, the gallium arsenide would be unstrained. The indium arsenide would be under tensile strain, but the gallium arsenide would be uh, under a 6.8% misfit and therefore would be tensile strain. In this situation, you have a tensile strain on a tensile strain. This leads to an unstable configuration. Therefore, your sample should show instability. However, when we do these samples, we saw just the opposite of what was predicted by the theory. We saw that the samples grown with the indium and seminar were actually unstable. Those grown with the gallium and seminar were stable. So this is where our study of the structural effects on uh, in the different layers can lead us or at least give us some idea of why we're seeing the opposite of what is predicted by theory and uh, how this actually occurs in the sample. So the samples are studied structurally by cost catching and SPM, which will just give us a view of what's actually going on. It can give us very much quantitatively, but qualitatively we can see what's happening with the sample. So the samples are seen under vacuum, and then this SPM tip is, is drug passed across the sample. Therefore, we can get a picture of exactly what the um, composition modulation and uh, structure of the sample looks like. So the samples are grown on gallium and timonide 100 substrate, or 001 substrate, and this is the growth direction. So you see the, the different colors in the layers, which is the AB layers of the substrate, or the indium arsenide and gallium and timonide. 
So this is what our nanostructure looks like in lateral composition modulation. And I'll explain this just a little bit more uh, later, but this is just to give you an idea of what we're seeing when we get an SPM image of the uh, actual sample. So what we end up with is a space center rectangular stack of medium large mile wires. It kind of looks like a waffle shape. And I'll, I'll explain to you exactly what's uh, shown here. And they're uh, ranged from 120 to 161 meters wide, depending on the thickness of our layer. And by using a common force microscopy, which looks at the very top surface of the sample, we see that there are wire forms that are printed microns in them. So not only do we have LCM, but we have LCM with the nanostructure formation of nanowire. So from the uh, cross-sectional SPM, this is an image of the sample as we start to grow. So here we have the substrate and the buffer, and the growth direction is along this direction. The bright layers are the um, gallium seminide, and the dark layers are the indium arsenide. So as we start growing, we see the layers of this topography, and all of a sudden we start to see this kind of variation of thickness for the indium arsenide layers. As the sample continues to grow, there seems to be a little bit more instability that sets in. Continues to grow until we get an instability that kind of gets a little bit regular after about 40 periods. And then continues, it continues with this uh, regular kind of structure. Actually, uh, I'll show you one in a little bit where it's so continue on and you can see the entire thickness of the uh, sample. So, what happens as the sample grows? Why did we get this instability that was onset at the very beginning of growth, almost after just growing a couple of periods of the sample? And why did it continue and form into this type of face center uh, rectangular type in the American eye uh, wires? So that's what we want to figure out. Say so not only do we see undulations in the sample, as far as thickness is concerned, we see that the Indian Martian eye, which is this dark region, it starts out at some thickness here and then kind of reduces down to be center here. We also see the same phenomena in the gallium seminar layers where we start off just kind of thin here and then thicker in this region. And I'll, I'll show you a better picture of this. So this shows you down to atom size. So you can also see that there are some of those little white atoms in the black region and a few of the little black atoms in the white region. So we know that we have some segregation of those anions from one layer to the other. Okay, this is just a close-up of the AFM of the sample showing that the um, nanostructures are about uh, 10, 10 microns in length or so. So the indium arsenide wires that are formed are several microns long. They're 1,200 angstroms wide, and they're about 80 angstroms tall, center to center. So this is just a mock image of what you can see in one of these little regions uh, as considered as an uh, indium arsenide uh, quantum wire. The bright and dark regions in this picture, you see these bright and dark spikes, they actually represent the variation in the composition of the sample, where the um, bright regions are the gallium and timonide rich regions, and the dark regions are the indium arsenide rich regions. Therefore, you have the indium arsenide wires surrounded by, the, by a gallium and temonide shell. So here's the picture where we have the entire thickness of the sample. It's 140 here if you go up to about 137. So you can see it starts off, you start getting undulation, they get a little bit more regular around 40, continue to be about regular. Then after about 80, they start to get a little bit less irregular, and then all of course it ends to kind of go away. So, what we'll be looking at is studying the structure of it, but we're going to have to look at the structure on average. We're going to have to look at what's happening on average over the entire thickness of the sample. So we can't study what's happening in the first 40 periods, what's happening in the second 40, and so on. We have to look at it on an average basis. Okay, so this is a close-up of what's there. So you have the Indian arsenide layer to dark regions, gallium arsenide layer to light regions, you see the thickness variation go from pretty thick to almost nothing. Pretty thick to almost nothing. In the gallium and seminar, not quite uh, so much of a thickness variation, 
but there is one there. So you can see here, it's pretty thick here where this falls on like the side of the wire or in the trough here of the wire. So it will pretty thick at some point and this starts to thin out. So why do we have a thickness variation in both the indium arsenide and gallium arsenide layer? And why do we have these undulations that occur in this sample? So what causes this LCM? This is what this study is about. The thickness undulations, greater undulations in the indium arsenide layers than in the gallium uh, and timonide layers. A lot of this is going to be attributed to the strain state and to the surface tension. In addition, why do we have that gallium and timonide growing thickest between the trough and the crest of the indium arsenide layer? And this most likely is going to be associated with growth kinetics. So, uh, this is what we're going to study. So I'm going to present to you the data for three different samples. One is a sample that had no lateral composition modulation, so it was planar, and it was grown with gallium arsenide bonds. You know, the gallium arsenide was, was supposed to give us the samples that were unstable, but actually gave us the stable samples. Then I'm going to look at two samples that had the lateral composition modulation, 140 periods, 100 periods with a gallium and seminized substrate and buffer, and then one with a gallium and seminized substrate and aluminum and seminized buffer, both with the indium uh, and seminized interfaces. So we're going to look at it structurally by using x-ray diffraction. So with x-ray diffraction, this is our super lattice. We send in an x-ray beam from a source. We use a copper rotating anode. And in, when the uh, X-ray fits the sample because of the period this is with these atoms that are uh, in the uh, structure. You're going to have the X-ray beam be diffracted from the surface at some angle. When Bragg's angle is um, satisfied, Bragg's law will give us Bragg reflections along the growth direction. By looking at these reflections, you can determine information about the periodicity of the sample as well as information about the composition of the layers and its lattice constant. So for a typical super lattice or a super lattice that's planar, this is a, a, the configuration that will be used. For the super lattices that also have the lateral composition modulation, we can use this configuration, but it will only give us information about the sample in the vertical direction. And we know that composition modulation is in the lateral direction, so we need to get more. We use a technique that's called a um, reciprocal space map, where you go off axis, off of your crystal axis, and look at the gravity reflections in that at that point. This will give you information about the sample along both the in-plane and the out-of-plane direction, so vertically and laterally. So for x-ray diffraction, we looked at both line scans and the typical space map. And I'll, I'll show you what a line scan is in a second. And this will give us information about the sample's uh, periodicity, the super lattice periodicity, which is that AB periodicity. We'll also get information about the lateral composition modulation periodicity, how often that occurs. We'll uh, also get the lattice constant for each super lattice layer. This will give us information about the composition of the indium arsenide and gallium and seminar layers. And this information can be used to determine the strain state of each of the layers. Okay, the background for my um, slides is just a, a picture of the Bragg reflections taken with a precession camera that just shows you the um, one of the peaks that is, that's on axis, which is the 004 and one of the off axis peaks, which is the 224 peak. So we did reflections about both of those peaks to determine uh, what was going on in the sample. So this is the orientation for the x-ray diffraction. Remember, for the vertical uh, samples, you just want to look at 5 to 90 degrees, and that 5 is from general and very to size. So you want it to come in in this direction. This will give you information directly about what's happening in the vertical direction. In this orientation, you'll get information about the vertical as well as the plane direction. So we looked at samples which were planar in both orientations, and because there is no lateral modulation in the planar samples, you would expect that the 5 to 0 and 90 orientation would give you identical pictures. 
And that's exactly what you get. I didn't actually show it here, but that's exactly what you would get. We also looked at the nanowire samples along the two directions so that we could get information about both the vertical and lateral direction. So here is a, a typical reciprocal space map for the nanowire. So the five to nine degrees are numbers is for the vertical direction. What you have here is these dots represent the drag reflections when drag law is satisfied. So the red spot represents the peak of the gallium from that substrate. There's a little orange peak underneath there that's very close to the uh, the red peak, which is the buffer layer, which is very, very close. They should be actually right on top of each other. And then you got a third peak, which is kind of the yellow peak, which is going to be your um, superlative zero order peak. So the superlative zero order peak indicates that you have some periodicity along the vertical direction. The zero order peak will then have satellite peaks about it, whereas the spacing of these satellite peaks will tell you something about the uh, lattice constant for the superlattice. So these satellite peaks are what you see along this direction. By looking at the spacing between these, it will determine the information about the superlattice composition itself. So this is now the size and zero of the orientation, which will give us information about the whole thing. It kind of maps out exactly what's there. It kind of mimics exactly what the sample looks like. This space in a rectangular uh, stacking of the layers. So again, straight down the middle will give you information about the vertical direction. Anything going in this direction will give you information about composition variation along the lateral direction. Again, you have that super lattice zero order piece for indication of what you have going on in the vertical direction. But now the super lattice zero order piece also has satellite peaks about it. Those satellite peaks are the satellite peaks which give us information about the composition modulation in the lateral direction. Now, you can have structures that are grown and have narrow structures, but not lateral composition modulation. So you can have these wires still, but still not have this composition modulation. If that were the case, then there would be no satellite peaks about the super lattice zero order peak in the vertical direction. You would have satellite peaks about all the others, but not about the zero order peak. In our case, we have it about the zero order peak as well as the other, so we're definite that there is lateral composition modulation, and this just verifies what we saw in the cross-sectional STM uh, image. So the information that we found from this uh, scan is that the planar sample at a super lattice frequency of about 80 angstroms, which is expected, in the marginalized gallium semi layers being both about 40 angstroms. The average super lattice constant along the growth direction is 6.11 angstroms, so it's not conformed to uh, the gallium seminized substrate. So it should have a lattice constant more closely related to the gallium seminized, which is about 6.09, but it's a little bit higher. So why are we getting a little bit higher super lattice? constant than expected. In the nanowire structures, again, we see the periodicity of about 80 angstroms in the zero orientation, but we see 160 angstroms action period from the 90 degree orientation, and that's directly related to the way that these are stacked. So if you look at it from the side, it looks like you have a single layer, uh, two layers of indium arsenide, two layers of gallium seminide, and so on. So you end up with a periodicity in this orientation that's actually quite of what you actually have. The average super lattice constant for these samples is about 6.1 angstrom, which again is a little bit higher than what we expect for this uh, sample. And the presence of LCM is there and to determine what the super lattice, uh, the lateral composition modulation periodicity is. So what we do for line scans is to take a scan about this line, straight through the center or we take a, lot, a scan about this line straight through the camera. Then by fitting this data using kinematical scattering theory, we can determine things about the composition of each layer and the strength of each layer. So this one is a line scan about the, um, let's see, this one is about the five to zero orientation, which gives us the vertical information. This will give us the outer plane uh, lattice constant for the super lattice, which again is larger than what we expected. So the dots of the data and the solid line is specific to the data. Here we have the scan of the lateral information about the super lattice. 
This fits all of the in-plane uh, lattice concept for the indium arsenide layer was much larger than what it should be. It also gave us a uh, value for the gallium and seminide that also was not what it was supposed to be. So because the indium arsenide layer is a layer that looks like uh, all the stability actually occurs there and everything else kind of is following, we're focusing more on looking at what's happening with that indium arsenide layer that might result in what we're seeing. So both the trainer and LCM samples both had larger lattice constants for the indium arsenide uh, uh, layer. You had about 20% incorporation, to, or 10 to 20% incorporation of antimony in those layers, which resulted in that larger lattice constant. And for the gallium uh, and seminide, we had 5 to 10% arsenic incorporated in those. So, What's inherent to this sample is that segregation of those anions into the other layers. So that's exactly what we're seeing. But how, this time, the segregation is enough to actually result, uh, result in alloying in the layer. When this alloying occurs, that also changes the lattice process and therefore changes the strength state of that layer with reference to the substrate buffer combination. So let's go back and look at what was predicted. For these samples, remember if we had the pure super lattices with no uh, incorporation of arsenic and antimony in the opposite uh, layer, the uh, gallium and seminar layers would be unstrained, and the indium arsenide layers would be under tensile strain. But with this incorporation, now the strain state of the layers has changed. The indium arsenide is now in the arsenide and seminar, and it becomes under compressive strain. And the gallium and seminide is not gallium arsenide, and seminide is under tensile strain. So now, when compared with the strain state of the uh, interfaces, we see that we have the opposite of what we had originally. Therefore, the number we were predicted to have stable for indium and seminal and unstable gallium arsenide, this is what causes you to get that switch. Because your indium arsenide layer is now under a different strain state than was originally predicted. The sample that has the aluminum in seminar just has a less compressive strain state, but it's still under compressive strain. So that picture, we go back to it. We see that the indium arsenide and seminar layers are compressive. Indium and seminar compressive. Remember, light strain end up giving you an instability. Here, we have opposite strain, which gives you strain balance, and that's how we get the opposite effect of what we originally thought we should see. Okay. So, when you're growing these samples, you start out, you're growing two-dimensional samples to get these layer by layer samples, resulting in something that you want to be planned. But what happens is at some point, you end up, because of instability or strain or stress in the layers, you end up we need something that looks like this. And this kind of represents a portion of our uh, nano water that we have. You end up getting a three-dimensional look and leading to some uh, instability. So this, we looked at the thermodynamic modeling to determine why was, that, was the instability occurring in these samples at such an early state. Remember, after about two weeks of the period, we already saw the instability. So we looked at instability uh, uh, thermodynamic um, models for a sample that's planar, and then kind of built on that and achieved the model that would explain what's going on in our sample. So if you look at before relaxation or before this instability occurs, the uh, surface energy before is equal to the surface energy of each layer, resulting from the strain in the layer, and the overall surface energy. Now, the surface energy related to the strain is due to the strain in the interfacial layer as well as the strain in the film layer. Where in this case, we're talking about the number of the indium arsenide uh, layer, and the indium and seminide interface. So it consists of two terms, which takes both the strain in those layers into account plus the overall surface energy. So, what happens now when instability occurs? Once instability occurs, then you have to reconsider what's happening because now you have to take into account that we have these two different anions in the interface and the actual layer. And you have to take into account the strain relationship between the two layers. So now this surface, uh, this strain uh, energy takes into account the residual energy 
denoted by this term R epsilon, that's due to the fact that the interface and the film or the interface in itself have some reaction. So interface and interface, so it has the interfacial strain plus the strain and the interfacial mix. Hopefully that makes sense. This is the uh, strain in the layer plus the strain due to the interface of the layer. So you have to consider both and then the surface energy. From this, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. The interaction is the the strain between the strain that relates to strain relation between the interface, which is the indium antimonide layer, and the indium arsenide layer, which is not indium arsenide and Okay. So this is a chemical or just a geometric um, mechanical? Mechanical, geometric strain, yes. Yeah. Because when you throw it on top of the buffer, it wants to adjust its lattice constant to fit that of uh, what is going on top of. That has to have some chemical um, dynamics. Well, the chemical dynamics come in in the surface energy. What happens with the atoms as they are uh, settling in where they want to be along the surface? So that's the chemical aspect. But the strain is actually related to how the atoms are placed relative to each other. Geometry, yes, the geometry. So using this and looking at the strain before and after, we see that um, the samples that were stable have the total energy before less than the energy after. That would result in a stable relationship. And those that were unstable would have the energy before greater than the energy after. The condition that we use to determine the transition thickness would be the point where these two energy states are the same, before and after. So by equating those two equations that we had previously, we can solve and get two equations, which will get an equation for the critical thickness. Now, the critical thickness is the thickness at which instability will start to occur, for example. So for typical uh, Three five samples in the type one orientation. This usually doesn't offset until about um, two two hundred milliliters, which is about two hundred eighteen. So this is quite different from than what we have for our sample. Our sample is only maybe four periods of forty angstroms each. So four times that's like two hundred. So it's about a third of what would happen for a type one uh, super lattice. So the critical thickness consists of two terms. The first term would be the critical thickness associated with the sample like I just discussed. One that has the same anions and that you will see some instability after about 600 uh, angstroms. The second term is a term which reduces that, which takes into account that you have to consider that we have arsenic and antimony and that the interfaces will actually have some play in the energy of the system. Therefore, this term reduces that critical thickness that would typically occur and reduces it by quite a bit. So we believe that this will reduce it enough to, to actually be able to describe what we're seeing in our sample, which is quite a bit of a reduction in critical thickness. So what we came up with after this structural analysis is that the strain state was changed, altered, due to the segregation of antimony and indium arsenide and arsenic into the gallium and timonide. This was very critical for leading to the instability of the indium arsenide layer, which then led to the instability in the uh, entire structure of the sample. Again, the surface tension with the alloy, the indium arsenide surface tension decreases while the gallium and timonide, which is now gallium arsenide and timonide, increases. Therefore, this kind of explains why we have more modulation in the indium arsenide region rather than in the gallium antimonide region, although we do still see undulations in both and thickness modulations in both. Why do the, does the gallium antimonide grow thicker on those sides of the wire? We believe that that's due to the fact that gallium antimonide is inherently tends to grow faster on one one and these faster, meaning that on the sides of these wires, Instead of being flattened smooth, they're actually like steps. This is a one-one in 
surface. It could be one, 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 two. Surface. And gallium and cement are just used to want to go fastest on those surfaces. So we believe that that explains why we still get thickness modulations of variations in the gallium and timonite as well, which results in our lateral composition modulation. So here is just a picture of some other samples that we've done. So we see similar results. Here we've drawn a thicker gallium and timonite layer, which just changes the uh, undulation wavelength. And here we have a different buffer. This is a picture of the, one of the other samples I talked about with the aluminum and timonite buffer, different thickness undulation. And this one is on the indium arsenide buffer and structure, and you see the get kind of sample, no modulations at all. And these both have the indium and timonite interfaces, this one gallium arsenide. So to summarize the structural characterization, um, you see that the strain state not only in the layers themselves, the superlattice layers, but also in the interface between them is very critical into uh, whether you get a uh, lot of composition modulation or not. We saw that if you had opposite sides of the uh, misfit, or if you had compressive and tensile, that you ended up with a strain balance system and the stable. If you had the same sign, compressive and compressive, you ended up with the unstable system. And we saw that the critical thickness could be shown to be reduced uh, by additional, uh, considering uh, the additional effects due to the interface in the thermodynamic model. So, fine, I think we've gotten a good handle on why it's occurring and uh, what actually causes it. That each step can it be used for something useful. Can it be used for outdoor electronic device development? Or can it be used to improve these devices? So now we're going to look at what happens to the optical response of the system. So remember, they're, they're developed to operate in the mid-infrared region. So we want to see what is the response of the system for this region. So here we have uh, the optical absorption response of both the planar and the nanowire structure. Now, the optical response, you use electrons to excite the system, and then you get these uh, creation generations of electron hole pairs, you see photons, and then you can see what actually is happening in the system. Um, here, we see that we can see some of the transitions that occur in the planar sample. These transitions would be transitions between the electron band and the hole band. But for the nanowire sample, and this is what would be typical for a uh, mid infrared detector operation. This sample was actually designed to operate at 8 microns, which has a cutoff wavelength, which is about over here, which is the 8 microns. That's where it hit zero. So that would be where that detector would operate. For the nanostructure sample, we see that the transitions are kind of um, mirrored out. Some of them are present but are quite broad. Uh, might even be questionable if they're actually present, but I think they're actually there because we've done a Fourier transform to figure out where these, uh, these bulk should fall, and these do represent some small uh, indication that there's some optical response from the nanowire sample. So it doesn't look like um, they're too promising for at least enhancing the performance of devices. In addition, we have a slight shift in the cutoff wavelength here. It's a little bit shorter. And um, let's see. just the broadness and the smearing out of the energy band would lead you to a device that's not as sensitive as one that has results that look like this. And it doesn't like this. So, what we've decided is that, okay, maybe there needs to be a different orientation for looking at what happens with these samples since they have nanowire. Maybe just looking at these samples with light hitting them straight on is not enough. Maybe you actually have to have the light parallel to the uh, quantum wires or align with the quantum wires in some way that you can see if there is some actual enhancement of the properties of the material. So before I go there, let's see. So 
the reason that we think we don't see this, you know, uh, same response of the nanowire structures is that it's actually fundamentally two different super lattices. So we shouldn't expect to see the same results. We may actually have to look at it in a different way to be able to see these results. So the super lattices actually grow, or what we expect to see is this one. But this is what we actually have. Remember, we have the gallium seminar with some very thin layers of indium oxide between. Then we have another thick gallium seminar. Then we have the big wires, and so on. So actually, we need some other uh, way to look at these samples to predict what would actually happen with them. This is the energy of band gap or the energy structure for this sample. The energy structure for this one is quite complicated to calculate, and we're working on that to see what it would actually look like. So in order for it to be used for optoelectronic devices, we have to show that we're going to have stronger, higher energy transitions. Otherwise, it's not going to be useful for either improving or developing new devices, because this is what would lead to greater sensitivity in the uh, material. So we decide to look at the samples using polarized absorption. And polarized absorption, like I said, would be put the light in at a certain polarization. So we chose polarization that was parallel to the sample. So this could either be, depending on which orientation the sample was, would be in the line of or in the plane of the wire. Then we had it perpendicular to the wire. Then we had it in the plane of the wire that can be tilted. That way, if the wires are not straight up and down or they're at some angle, we can use the polarized light at various angles to try to tune ourselves into the quantum wire. So what we found is that <clears throat> for the samples with, that were planar, using polarized absorption, we didn't see any real changes on the individual effect by the uh, optical response of the devices. And this black curve, which is with no polarization, uh, it's just shifted down for, for clarity. It actually is false right underneath the left of them. So there's no real enhancement there, uh, which is pretty much expected for the planar sample. That's just a close up. And here is the a typical nanowire sample. Again, we don't see very much in the way of the energy transition and with polarization at various angles within the plane to make sure we're trying to align ourselves right up with the quantum wire, we still don't see very much enhancement. There's a little bit of change in position. Uh, as we blow it up, you can see a little bit, but this enhancement is not enough to explain that presence of quantum wires in the line of composition modulation is least to in a grand improvement. So it looks like our nanowires are not going to be um, giving us these grand structures that we or a grand performance in, in the technique that we hope. However, we did see some uh, different response from the structure that was run on the gallium seminar and the seminar substrate uh, buffer combination. The energy transitions were still present. They're at different uh, orientations because of the different strain states in the uh, layer, but they were present. Whereas with the other structures run on the gallium seminar and gallium seminar, they, they were kind of just washed out. They are still present, but even with the polarization along different directions, and I just didn't show all of them here, we still didn't see any grave enhancement in the uh, performance of the system uh, as far as optical um, enhancement. So, in conclusion, we determined the strange state of the immunomarcinized gallium and terminal systematics and, and found that the interface layer was very key in the formation of this calcium and the nanowire structure. The transition thickness, we found a model which should describe the transition thickness or the critical thickness that we saw for our samples, which resulted in the formation of this structure so early on in growth. And from the optical uh, characterization, we saw that the signature transition for a typical planar sample was suppressed when we had the nanowire samples. However, the um, Aluminum and timonide still showed reasonable response, but no great response when we looked at it with polarization effect. Now, we've also tried to do photoluminescence studies uh, on the sample as well with the polarization technique. 
we saw uh, no photo I mean, no uh, response to the system at all. So we're trying to devise some other measuring techniques. Uh, one is to use a different story. So we've been told that uh, sometimes if you have a source of a certain weight, once you may not see your photoluminescence, but other sources may result in the photoluminescence. This is something we're just trying to uh, figure out. And um, we also just need to get a sensitive, more sensitive detector, although I think we have one of the most sensitive detectors in the indium antimonide detector that we use on our system. But there are other things that can be done. Uh, that we can try to see if we can detect any type of photoluminescence. But typically, if we have to go through these measures, that nanolarge structure is not something that's actually going to enhance the system. Maybe it can be used for some other application, but not for enhancing the system for detectors. Um, and future studies, we also plan to look at the electrical response of the system, where the nanolarge may actually be useful. Um, we've done holotech measurements on it from um, zero to nine tesla. So we look at what happens, and we actually are seeing quantum hall effects in the planar sample, but because of the high resistivity of the nanowire structure, we're not seeing anything from the nanowire structure. So we think we have to overcome either contact issues or just figure out why are we getting such a high resistivity with these samples before we can actually perform the measurements on those to see if we can get anything out of them useful to the right So that's what I have to present to you today. I hope you enjoyed it and let me know if you have any questions. There's an effective mass theory, there's a KP theory, there's at least four or five others, but we're using the KP theory to calculate out. And um, I mean, it's a known theory, it's not something we pulled out of the dark. It's a known theory that can be used for supermagnetism for calculating the band structure. So you can use that, that uh, theory to predict uh, what wavelength your supermagnetic will have a cutoff at. So you can design your device for whichever way you like, depending on the applications that you have. Also, um, when you're growing your films, mm -hmm. uh, is it good measuring or is the testing one? Does that have an effect on the growth? No, the testing is not doing not done during growth. The growth is done uh, by MBE, where you have all of these different cells of various elements. And you shoot out atomic beams that intend to form a surface, and this surface is your substrate, and your substrate is heated. So as these beams hit your sample, you're depositing atoms one at a time, creating the layer. The only thing that's going on during the growth, typically, is mass spectrometry, which is to monitor the background in your system, and reflection high energy uh, diffraction need, which tells you if your sample is going to dimension. So when you're growing, you have this uh, electron beam hitting your sample coming off. You have a screen off to the side. You see the lead pattern there, and it will tell you if your sample is going uh, two-dimensionally by these nice, straight, streaky spots. And when you get this three-dimensional growth, it starts in a bunch of little dots. It tells you that something's going on in growth. It's not now growing atom by atom, atom layer by layer. So these techniques are all afterwards. X-ray diffraction is not destructive. So you can do x-ray diffraction on the sample and take it and do some other techniques on it. Um, the only thing that's destructive is the electrical measurement because you have to put contacts on it. Once you put the contacts on, you can make the contact off. Um, another problem we had is with the samples that contain the aluminum. The aluminum is very sensitive to air. So when we do measurements on the aluminum, oftentimes we saw that our samples start to peel away and just kind of go away. So you have to be really careful when you have aluminum in the sample. So, uh, keep a calculator on them and also keep them on the back end when you're not looking at them. But for the most part, none of these techniques do any damage or affect the actual uh, structure or results of the sample. Mm -hmm. um, would it be possible to go away using a different method like chemical vapor deposition? Mm -hmm. Right, but the point with, well, with uh, detector and laser fabrication, 
you want the highest quality material possible. MBE is it. CBE, CBD or chemical vapor deposition, those type techniques can grow the same material but the quality is not near what you would get with MBE. Okay, uh, any other questions? Uh, thank our speaker again. And um, also, uh, next week, uh, we're going to have spring break, so there is not a seminar next week, and uh, we're going to meet again in uh, two weeks from today, which is going to be the 21st. So, uh, hopefully.